Hey, what's up? There's no MC, so I'm going to introduce myself myself. Um, I assume all you guys are here because you like design or some interested in part of it and all of its manifestations, and so that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about. Um, my name is David Schwarz. I'm a partner at a company called Hush out of New York, and we are a design agency, and that, what that means to us is that we use design in all of its forms to, to tell good stories, to bring a brand to life in interesting ways. And um, we're, we're highly known, I think, for kind of experiential design, which is, again, another buzzword, so I want to clarify. You know, it's about people like us in spaces together, communing, learning, feeling, understanding. Um, and, you know, we build these experiences that are highly digital and revolve highly around content and data and technology and visceral senses, you know, ways to really make us feel like we're in something together. So, um, I guess this is the last session of the conference, so we should kind of, I'm going to try to keep transparency as a nice bookend uh, to everything. But I want to look at this word of transparency a little bit clearer, because when I interpreted it, I thought of it as, you know, truth in, in some way, right? Like we're talking about truth, and we're talking about um, making information clearer and more true, or making a, a, an experience more true or honest, um, or taking something that's intangible and making it tangible. So those are the things I want to kind of explore. Um, I'm going to show you tons of stuff. I think I'm going to end a little early so you can have questions and things, but I'm a big fan of showing and not telling. That's sort of a mantra in our company. So I'm going to show you a lot of video and image and stuff and talk through it. And hopefully through this experience, we'll kind of look at design in a, um, in a broader way. And uh, those of you who are designers or are close to design, um, you will maybe stretch your mind and feel liberated to explore other avenues of design as well, because that's, I think, what, we, what we've done as a company, what I've done as a person, and I think it's a really fabulous, fabulous thing. So, so, you know, I think the idea of design, it makes the invisible visible, right? It, it takes data, which is frankly invisible to most people, and makes clarity out of it or makes sense of it, which I think is super, super interesting. And... Um, I think it also makes the intangible tangible. So you forget about data, let's talk about like the, the certain sort of je ne sais quoi of a brand, right? Like, you know, you want to feel a certain way. That's quite an intangible thing, but you're able to somehow use all the tools at our disposal, sight, sound, image, data, interface, form, material, and somehow you put this in a crazy soup and out comes this tangible sort of feeling, a visceral feeling. So we spend a lot of time talking at our company about how you mix all these design practices and things and thinking and how you create something out of that that's probably more transparent. So I think that the tricky thing about design is that, and anyone is a designer in the room, you kind of, how many times you say, oh, what do you do? And someone says, oh, I'm a designer. The next thing they ask you is, well, what do you design? And so design is like intimately attached to the medium, which I think is an unfortunate thing, because then you're always proving that you can design X or Y, and you're not really thinking about design with a capital D, and what that means about taking abstract ideas and needs, sometimes business goals, and forming something that you think achieves that. So, you know, like, you know, my mom thinks design is like this, you know, <laughs> and I bet you a lot of other moms do as well. So. You know, I've spent my whole career, you know, having that question asked back to me, oh, design like interiors, like fabrics? And you're like, no, not really, not at all. Um, although the weird part is we're sort of starting to get into that a little bit, so this is maybe not that far from the truth. Um, but I'm going to give you just a random, sloppy, quick selection of things that we've done that I'm not going to show you today in depth. But, you know, because I want to prove to you the breadth of our company and what we do. Um, and what we think about and what I, what I really enjoy. So, you know, we think of everything from, you know, visualizations of global connections between people. This is a project we did with Estee Lauder, connecting women uh, on different sides of the globe. 
through a single kind of pen pal share that were only available to do at a certain time of night. So a simple expression in the browser, you know, probably the most familiar to everyone in this room. But that's one type of design, you know? It's visualization of communication, understanding of transparency of an idea about connections and about the night. Um, we did a project with Google Creative Lab. I'm also not going to show you. Um, but it was about looking at Google Chrome and WebSockets and real-time communication between uh, Chrome browsers despite the device or the operating system. So anybody running a Chrome browser on a laptop or a mobile device, um, there was a game that they had in beta, and we basically built an installation that allowed anyone to come and place your device down on the table. And you could play this kind of old 8-bit style slot car game and literally race cars from your screen onto this table surface and back onto other people's screens, and so on and so forth, in real time with, with nothing else but Chrome browsers talking to each other. Another type of design. Now we've broken out of the browser, and we're talking about design of browser in interface and physical structure to house that gaming experience, which is kind of a big love of ours as well. You know, we do a lot of work for Nike, and looking at how you add tactility to something. You know, a product like this, which is all about squishy, you know, twisting and turning, that's the product feature and the product benefit, it doesn't really come through in the digital sphere. So how do you create multi-touch experiences that, you know, at least with your hand, you kind of get this sort of sensual understanding of what the product is, even through the lens of, of a highly digital experience. Again, adding a level of transparency and understanding what the product benefit is. So design and transparency there. Um, or understanding, you know, runners who are phenomenally aggro and obsessed about running routes and, and top routes and elevation gains and changes and visualizing that in a piece of software. This is a little project we did with ExxonMobil to talk about the biggest, the biggest oil field in the world and how over the next 50 years they have to look toward environmental concerns and production concerns. And so we took this incredibly abstract, incredibly large from a scale standpoint, subject matter, trillions of dollars of investment, hundreds of square miles, um, thousands and thousands of miles of infrastructure over the next century. How do you tell that story in a simple way? Well, we decided to do it like a children's puzzle with, uh, with um, acrylic blocks, fiducial markers, and a sort of game experience that you could do nothing wrong. But you knew when you were doing something right, and when you were doing something right, you got visual and audio feedback that told you, this is how we want the future to go. This is the best, the best direction to go for everyone involved. So again, design of physical digital interfaces that tell a story and make something that's incredibly complex and we spent months learning about seems simple and obvious um, from a, an experience standpoint. Light sculptures driven by data, looking at data of running and track and field and how light can be, light, like a lighting experience can actually be generated by real-time data and express something um, that sort of has a meaning to it but is highly abstract, but at least bringing to light the frequency and ideas behind that data. And stuff like uh, simple as Facebook applications, but applications that generate custom artwork based on the data input of your photo, the geo data of that photo, the RGB values of that photo, plus your open, open graph data in Facebook, all mushed together makes a unique sort of data curve for you. And then we translated that to essentially really beautiful mandala visualizations that are all unique because all of your data is unique. So that's design. And then, you know, physical digital stuff where you can play and express ideas of energy um, and flows of energy uh, just through physical movement and gesture. So I went through that quickly um, in, on purpose because I want to focus on a, on a few other things. But just to keep hammering home this design idea, you know, for us, fundamentally, what I want to talk about and what you'll see in the work today is that we mix kind of technology, although we never lead with technology, with visual, audiovisual, and physical form. So I think, you know, where most of us are trained as 
visual designers or artists. You know, we have filmmakers, we have front-end software developers, we have graphic designers, motion designers, environmental architects, architects. Uh, and everything we do kind of mashes up this sensibility of design and making and kind of bringing truth out of an idea. But we rely, as we all do in this room, heavily on technology. So that's not just software, but that's hardware and screens and systems and everything. So we never pitch ideas or lead with a cool new thing if a client calls and says, hey, we have this you know, augmented reality idea. We literally almost hang up. Um, it's, you, you, we just don't do that. And so we, we, we need to be approached with problems, you know, goals, um, ideas that are trying to tell an interesting story. And then from there, I think the hallmark of our company and why I'm interested in what we do all the time is that we kind of, we don't, we don't go with the expected, you know. My expected move as a designer is probably visual. You know, my first move is a pencil to paper. But that always leads to the same kinds of work, if that's what your first move is. So we approach problems highly agnostically, and we force ourselves to kind of avoid the expected first move, if you will. And so we may approach a problem about building a structure or a space for somebody, and we might actually start with like sound design, because we feel that sound might unlock some idea about the design or the way it moves or the way it sounds or the way it hits you that actually can be translated into some kind of physical form, you know? So I, I think it's, it's a challenge to say, like, don't always go with the default. You have to kind of approach things from other areas and surround yourself with people that design in different ways and from different uh, angles than you do. So in short, what I'm saying is design sort of is this weird process of dissecting an idea from a million different angles where there's no right way. It's just... Every way is the right way. So before I get into this, you know, design tra creates transparency. That's the thesis that I'm trying to instill in you guys, and I think, I think we're there. But I want to show you three design projects today. Uh, one's for Nike, another sort of half for Nike, uh, and the third one's for IBM. And I think through those, you'll see kind of a real mix of, of tactics and ideas and things we've implemented across all these mediums, but all under the umbrella of design. So the first one is a project we did last year. It's a really nice project um, because I feel like it really hit all of our senses and all of our abilities at the company. Um, it was for the US Olympic trials and it was at, in Eugene, Oregon and that was three weeks before the London Olympics. And why the US Olympic trials are important for Nike and for runners and track and field enthusiasts everywhere is because that's Nike's home, right? Nike, oh, sorry, that's Nike's birthplace. 40 years ago, or now 41 years ago, it was um, where you know, the waffle sole came out of the back of the car. And they sponsor 80% of the athletes uh, competing in the Olympic trials. The last stop before London, uh, they launched Nike Plus, 2.0, they launched Fuel Band, Flyknit, several other seminal Nike products, both digital and physical, last year at this time. So it was a major, major confluence of, of you know, stuff, Nike's history, opportunity, and moment um, in time. So it was important. So they wanted to do something big. Um, and so these were all these things we looked at. You know, we, we were privileged to go and check this stuff out and get to play with it and you know, talk, talk to people and learn about top secret things, and, and that's all great. But the whole point of that is immersion into this idea of, 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 of what, what the story is and what the point of it is. And out came a brief from Nike, um, eight months out from the delivery of this project, which is how does Nike make you feel fast? It's a pretty awesome brief, I would say. We, not, we usually don't get them that, that good, um, but it's good. Uh, and so, it was broad enough that I think it was perfect for our company, but specific enough in terms of time, location, goals, you know, products, that it allowed us to kind of corral the design process and really focus on some stuff. So this is a broad statement, but we really looked at just you know, the, an image of what I might think is fast and, and sort of dissected this word of fast across all of our design principles, you know, and, and all of the mediums we could explore. 
And so in some way, we're literally taking the idea of fast and just cutting it up. And, you know, sound can feel fast. Spaces can feel fast. Light can feel fast. Data can feel fast. You know, all these things. And we, we did a bunch of stuff, which I'm going to show you. So the idea of fast is something visceral, right? You know, we've all been around something fast. And so like, you know, your head turns and it's like, that's amazing. The idea of fast is a communal kind of experience. Like, what if we all are fast together? And the idea of materials being fast, which is something Nike thinks about a lot. Like, you know, they, they develop these crazy speed suits where you're like, they're literally taking fractions of a second, milliseconds off their pro athlete's time because of a change in material or wind, def excuse me, wind deflection. So materials can be fast, too, and they can, they can act in interesting ways. And then the competitive nature of fast, which is probably the most obvious one. Like, am I faster than you, or are you faster than me? So let's start with one. And again, you know, our company is built on design, but in a more traditional sense. Like, like I said, most of us come from some sense of graphic design, I'd say, when we started. So odd that we would start you know, in parallel with sound as an idea for fast, but you know, we love music, we love sound, that's a totally infinite medium unto itself about how to capture sound and design sound. So we, I think we built some application tests that took Nike Plus data and looked at them in terms of their sound. This application is part of our research concerning the way that we can map information from the Nike Plus database to an aesthetic experience. The line you see in front of you is a representation of Joe's most recent run. The X coordinate represents the distance, the Y coordinate represents the speed. This is what it sounds like. We can add in additional users, and as each additional user gets added, note the change in the texture of the audio. In that manner, we can essentially create a unified sound of Nike Plus. Now we have a lot more Nike Plus users added into our application. Note that the sound is more complex when we click. Additionally, individual users can be sounded. In that way, there's a sequence to the way that the sound is played back. And through the use of randomization, we can create a never-ending sequence, one that continues as long as the installation is set up. The speed of this can be varied as well. You get the idea. Um, you can also assign any kind of MIDI sounds to that same data, right? So all of a sudden we have this idea of like playing fast, you know? Playing the sounds of fast, the sounds of a running community. We thought it was really interesting. What about the sounds of materials, right? We took um, some of these materials are um, the stuff like right out of some of their products, right? Metallic tensile structures, things like that. So we put contact mics on the materials and wanted to hear how they might sound in the most like natural way. There's like no MIDI, you know, in between this. It's almost giving it the most purest sound of the material itself. And is that something we can use to kind of augment the idea of what Nike's doing and maybe make us, our experience more intimate with the design of that product, you know? So both those ideas got killed, by the way, which is, an, you know, it's a testament to Nike's uh, ability to only want the 2% of best of everything. Um, so there are things that, you know, died on the vine that I, I feel really bummed about. But anyway, what about a computer's perception of fast? So we looked at, you know, just some motion tracking and camera visualization in terms of vectors and, and how us running like idiots outside of our studio could be translated into something visual. It's pretty ugly visuals, but it was just a, you know, sequence of tests. But then you take that same data and you give it a little bit of, of love, and I don't know if you can see it in here, but it's, you know, pure flow. It takes the clunkiness of our running and sort of just translates it into something that's quite beautiful. So computers can see fast in a way that we can't see fast, and then we can use design to kind of translate it to just the things we want to show and express. Well, I'm like a, I studied architecture for a little bit, never did it, so I'm kind of like a failed or, 
or stunted architect, but now I get to play in this world with our, with our team and our partners, and so I love this stuff. But, you know, we looked at um, the architecture of FAST with the architectural partner in Portland uh, called Skylab, a super good boutique firm. And we looked at FAST in terms of angles and the way people move through a space and how they perceive structures around them. And we, we looked at just the feeling of being in spaces and how can then spaces be augmented by you know, media and sound or feel like they're compression chambers or they urge you to move down uh, themselves linearly. So you know, all these tests about fast and what it might be like to perceive fast within an architectural space. And then of course, everyone, you know, data, data, data. But there is something interesting about data, and data being really fast, and we'll, we'll hit on this a little later, but you know, there's an amazing idea here where all that data mapped to something might express the speed of a community in a way that they've never seen before. And, and we ended up really digging into that a little bit tighter. So this is, this is the actual piece that we built. And it was in Eugene, you can see it. It's about the size of a football field. It's constructed out of three primary digital physical pavilions. There's a retail space to the bottom left. The entire reason for being of this entire space is to express fast in every pixel, every material, every angle. So the buildings are built with the angles in mind of a sprinter in the blocks, okay? The, the digital experiences inside are all about expressions of fast through sound, participation, community, data. And this is kind of what it looked like in plan, a little closer. And here's it being built in 10 days. Oh no, shit. Uh, that's the next slide, okay. So each pavilion was, uh, was housing like an experience like I just said, these shards. 10 days. So here are the experiences, which real quick, you know, I'll just set up the, the film. We had a, a running game, so it's the most literal expression of fast you can have. It's me and you against each other for 30 seconds. How fast can I run? But the design of it was highly, quote unquote, immersive, right? We're using technologies, display technologies, software, connect cameras to really vi visualize your literal, like filling up from red to green of performance. Um, we're harnessing the digital signal out marrying that with your photo photograph, creating social content dynamically that's shared with Nike platforms if you're good enough. Um, that's one piece. So on. You have these like aggro 18 year olds who can run faster than anyone I've ever seen and trying to kill themselves literally. And then you had like 80 year olds who were like, you know, chugging along, but they were playing. So fast is relative, I suppose. Um, we did a data visualization, which I'll show more about later mapping all of Nike Plus runners in the, every community, so this Eugene community, and you could literally see how fast um, your, 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 your runners in your area were. And then this is the most visceral representation of fast. It's um, 100 feet of sound and image, 12 channels of audio and bass, and it dynamically pulls in split times of the runners, which we captured with cameras on the field, and we render in virtual real time, we wrote some software and rendered these avatars down the length of the wall uh, at the exact speed they just ran on the track. So if someone set a world record or a 9.600 meter dash, you would feel a 9.600 9 meter dash um, go by you, which is a feeling that you don't have unless you're press or you're a pro and you can be on the, on the track with everyone else. So this was like, you know, you bring this unique feeling um, to, to people. I think we, we liken it to like if you're a surfer and everyone talks about like a 15 foot wave and then you actually go out in a 15 foot wave, it's like you know, you're know you scared to death because it's really a 15 foot wave. So um, this is the same thing. It's talking about fast as scale and bringing something that's on the track to the, the personal experience. So here's a two minute little film where you see it happen.
was a beautiful smile. in the Eugene geofence, essentially. Took a you know, XY coordinate of geography and said, look at all the runners running and show me their top routes, who's running, where they're running. And you could run and end up there in real time and see yourself on the, on the board. So you get the idea. We were able to roll it out to Moscow in pieces, um, to Shibuya Station in Tokyo. Really interesting cultural changes, thinking about design in terms of cultural uh, norms. Uh, the treadmill game was way different in Tokyo. Uh, different kind of competitive spirit, different kind of deference to your competitor. It still worked great, it just was a very different experience, which was really interesting. Um, and then our most successful piece of this was actually this data piece, and so this data viz Multi-touch experience is now live in like 12, 15 stores around the world. This is in the New York Flatiron store. And I'll just show you how we did it, but I think it's a kind of cool aspect of design and building a kind of tool and an idea that, that houses a simple idea, which is about local community, um, but part of a global you know, digital platform of data and speed and runners. Before I go to the next one, I just, you know, the, to me, I, I, I want this to be like really positive. I, you know, I want, if any of your designers in the room, like you should be able to take on or have the, the desire to take on the, the, the diversity of quote unquote design in that project. No one, you, don't, you know, I think it's such bullshit when I hear like, oh, I didn't go to architecture school. I don't understand form. Like if you're a UX designer, you should be able to take on moving images. If you're a moving image person, you should be able to take on UX. If you're a filmmaker, you should understand interactive architecture because you understand telling a story and levels of information. If, you know, if you build spaces, you should be able to kind of see them in CG and do motion and animation because it's just like walking in reality. 
I really, really believe that that's true. And yes, you need experts, but you, the design ability and why I'm so into it and why I'm even talking about it is because I believe design is like this through line and it, and it allows you to do everything. You can be a chameleon and really explore stuff. And I think like, that's what our company has really excelled at and kind of done the, the thing that everyone tells you you can't do, you know? Um, this next project is for, can I, what's my time? Or time left? Cool, perfect. Um, so this next project was Let's Move organization, which is uh, Michelle Obama's sort of, uh, you know, uh, active kids, active schools program about getting kids to, to move, move faster, move better. Just as the idea of any movement you do, walking to school, standing up in class, playing on the, on the, the basketball court, whatever. It doesn't have to be formalized sport. It's about movement and just basic movement and not being sedentary will, will flip some of the health problems that kids are having um, in the world and in the country. So what's interesting is Nike uh, partnered with them uh, to, to kind of solve this problem. And so I think this piece is really about transparency in terms of giving meaning to aggregate movement, like our movement, movement in groups, physical movement. And how do we do that? And this is actually a failed project, so it's the first time I'm showing it. I just thought there was really cool stuff in there, so it never made it really to, to, the, to the world. But that's uh, Nike CEO and Michelle Obama, and he's shaking her hand and giving her a check for $50 million. And um, that's cool, right? Obvious brand connection for, for the, the, um, the organization. But what they wanted to do in Chicago for the announcement of this was take 5,000 kids behind a curtain and upon the handshake, with all the theatrics, the, the scrim would rise and 5,000 kids would run out. And then Usher would come out and do his thing. And those 5,000 kids once behind the scrim, we're now in front of, or they were the audience, okay? That's cool. But the gag with that was that at a concert for Usher, maybe the kids would move, dance, hang out, wave their hands, whatever they want to do. But that, as a testament to this partnership, that is movement. It doesn't have to be go run five miles, it's movement. So. They wanted to capture that movement in some kind of designed visual expression to get people to understand that any movement is good movement and any movement can be quantified and any movement can be quantified positively for your own health. So let kids see the power of movement. Simple, right? But if you're like a nine-year-old kid and you don't even understand like what that means because you're nine, you know, maybe you have this one insight and you just, maybe you grow into a really good athlete, maybe you don't, but at least you stay, or you, you avoid being sedentary. So we started looking at movement in aggregate, you know? It's like, okay, cool, marathon runners run and they move and it's crowds. But like, how do computers see this movement and could we translate aggregate movement into some kind of designed experience so that these kids and the press and the PR around this event would be able to see how this partnership between Nike and, and Michelle's organization was about, you know, about positive energy and seeing the positivity of that energy. So in a parallel path, um, a, a brand agency was working on kind of the visual style of this campaign, which is kind of this cool like uh, pattern-based uh, pattern identity. So we took that and we started to derive, you know, and augment and kind of give ourselves more tools to play with in the design world. And so we were building all these cool visualizations about, you know, taking that and knew they were going to be activated. And essentially these things were supposed to become meters, if you will, like almost like EQ, you know? Um, so literally as the kids move, you would see your meter tick up and together they could actually see the positivity of their aggregate mo movement and effort. At the same time, maybe we could figure out how certain parts of the audience were being more stagnant and others were being movement. We could actually play the audience against each other a little bit so that everyone was unified in movement. So we had an aggregate problem to solve. We also had like, indi like uh, individual areas of the audience. But we were looking at all this visual language and then we were starting to look at, since Nike's a sponsor, obviously Nike has a brand language from red to green. Um, it's throughout their fuel band and plus and all this stuff. So we were looking at how to assign meaning through design for a kit of parts, a kit of identity tools and brand tools. 
And just really quick, you know, these are design ideas, design style frames, things about how collectively we can see that brand language become literal um, representations of movement and, and energy. So fun, fun stuff, super fun stuff. Could have been rad. But, <laughs> but all these things, you know, imagine being surrounded with this kind of stuff and, you know, ushers playing and we have the, the collective power of movement happening in front of us. And then looking at how that's, that, that, that's, see, that shows itself in, in, in moving image, but also moving image that's moved by software and an understanding of a computer's eye of, of movement um, and making it look cool and on brand. So now you, know, you, now you flip all that stuff, we, sh we show the design, we show the ideas, and then you take and you start to look at, well, there's an underlying movement in any kind of imagery. So we're looking at heat mapping, um, heat center points, infrared center points of everyone's body. So we had technology and doing uh, experiments around looking at crowds like that, and you can accurately predict like a pretty interesting center point of heat, so you can know an XY coordinate of almost every person dancing or moving and how the frequency of movement. Uh, on an individual level, obviously you can take uh, ideas with optical flow and, and camera imagery and actually apply visualizations to them so you get a sense of movement um, with or without the person being visible. And obviously that can be translated into amazing studies to feedback to the kids the success or failure of their collective movement. And then of course, as you build software and get closer to what, um, what you want to make, you can control that visualization. So this was studies about like an overhead shot of what kids might be doing in terms of a, a, a pattern of movement and how to actually di distort that and make that look like interesting things so that they could see themselves um, performing, if you will, performing better or worse as a crowd. And so this really interesting overhead imagery of, of that kind of movement, I think, that sort of have a, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's transparency about design, but I think it sort of lends itself to just show you what, 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 what we're talking about and focuses your idea on positive and negative and collective action. And so the idea was to actually overlay this kind of thing into the audience so that on an aggregate, aggregate scale, you could see the power of it. Um, but as I said, that didn't really happen. This happened, and um, <laughs> I mean, that's cool. It wasn't quite what we were imagining. It was a little bit, a little bit different than we were imagining, but a successful and good program nonetheless. Uh, no fault of uh, the first lady. So, so I'm going to show you one last one. Uh, and this is also a similar kind of ideology. But IBM essentially uh, was, they do some interesting stuff, but they also do some really not interesting stuff. And the not interesting stuff they do is they do huge data collection and analysis, which major Fortune 100 companies do all the time. But they do it for stuff that's not that consumer friendly, right? So they, they they track uh, weather patterns and shipping routes and they insurance premiums and then they correlate that data so that you know you can guess shipping patterns and there's less accidents and there's more on-time deliveries and you know costs go down so that kind of analysis and big data analysis is what they sell to their fortune 10 clients all that stuff's pretty opaque to me at least and I serve many people in this room so how do they make this more friendly well what they did was they they gave transparency to this big data play by partnering with the USTA, the US Tennis Association. And so for the last eight years, they've been tracking every point of play for the top 100 men and women in the entire world. So for every serve Federer hits, there's, in every rally with his opponent, there's 80 data points that come out of that. So it could be you know, intrinsic data points like speed of his serve or maybe location X, Y of where it hits, or um, the temperature at that moment he struck the ball, or they, can, they pull in third-party API data, like you know, social sentiment from Twitter, or weather data, or, or transit data. So they have all this interesting data for every point of play for a pretty wide data set. Now, 
it's interesting, and you can do something fun with that. So this was actually some of the code. I mean, we made it pretty for this you know, presentation because no one likes looking at raw code. But um, the, you know, there's real stuff in here. There's real points and data being generated in real time for every point of play. And there's a bunch of dudes in the data center all wearing blue shirts who, you know, who collect it. So you can do something pretty cool with it. So you know, forget the marketing angle. It was just about making data fun. It was about taking these really abstract and quite opaque ideas about big data and data services and relating them to me, like the, the B2C, the C of the consumer. And, and I think it's actually a really smart move because it's a metaphor. And I think back to the idea of transparency, it's about making something that's highly opaque and foreign quite transparent and closer to me. Even if you're not into tennis, you know what tennis is. So as designers, to try to bring this kind of transparency in, we, we actually hired a tennis cartographer, which is a really cool title. I've never seen on a business card, but apparently one exists. And he was really interesting, and he helped us formulate deeper insights into how the game's played. So simple things to look at, like, well, you know, a match lasts X amount of time, it's broken up into sets, each with their own time, people win and lose the sets, broken into games. And so, like, we started to generate visuals that, that expressed that win-loss time and kind of generated a lot of, like, overlaps of just that interesting data. You know, iconography studies about how to express that. Um, understanding that tennis is an interesting game and there's only, only a certain handful of permutations and combinations of gameplay, right? 15, 30, 45 game, but you can do that in many different ways. But it's not that complicated, so actually seeing that and pulling it apart and understanding tennis as a game of data was really interesting. So all of this through design and, and creating little sort of infographics or vises of things that express you know, that data. So something that express errors very clearly, first service, second service, things that you know, just really can tell me a little bit more about the data that's collected above and beyond what you see you know, on a big scoreboard or you can get on ESPN.com. So that was the first part of the design piece. And then we started to get a little bit more complicated and understand a little bit more about tennis data and why it matters and how it influences perspective to win or how it just shows you interesting but totally useless information. Because that's still fun too. It doesn't have to actually do something. And then we started uh, building an interface around this idea of um, the tennis ball. So how could we this year, because we've done this two years in a row, how could we this year make the entire experience for users, this is going to become an installation at the US Open, I probably should have told you that, um, where like the act of tennis and the game of tennis is sort of subtly embedded into the user experience. So it's not just clicking and tapping, it's actually kind of, it feels a little bit looser, it feels like you could, it feels playful, and it plays off of the, the norms of tennis. And so we built this thing about a tennis ball, and each tennis ball would be able to open up and sort of reveal its contents. And those contents could be everything from a simple stat to more, much more interesting and, and relatable data. But it, was, it felt very fast, it felt very real time, because again, remember, you're watching this match play out in real time through our interface. So Federer hits an ace, it's in our system within milliseconds, and then affects that tennis ball data you're looking at. So you need to feel that expression and we, we started treating things like, oh, this whole experience is going to be a lens through which you watch the game. You're not standing there watching the game. You're just watching the game through the lens of data and user interface. So again, the tennis ball becomes our kind of sun to the information at the center, telling you interesting stuff. Um, once you smash it into this little thing, it comes and expresses you know, keys of the match and things that are inside. And then even more so, it also becomes a sort of centerpiece uh, around which a lot of data and information modules sort of spread out and show you what's going on. So, again, not like crazy. It wasn't about going so deep because, you know, that's not the fan base. That's not the audience we want. It's about understanding one or two levels deeper into the game and how the game works and how there's trends and propensities that, that come from the gameplay itself but also come from third-party things like temperature and length of play. 
So ultimately we made a sort of five screen multi-touch experience that both has its individual ability to control your own world as well as throw things back and forth in a very kind of game-like uh, grander experience. So these tennis balls had physics engines moving and we could, we could, they could bounce around, you could throw them around the screen. I could say, oh, Federer and Nadal, you want that one? I could find it and throw it to my friend at the other end and so on and so forth. So I think it was really successful in bringing a layer, a layer of, of interest uh, to the data through, through a specific kind of user experience. Anyway, take a look. Thanks. I'd love to answer some questions. Don't be shy at all. I'm really friendly. But you got to go to the mic is what they told me. Or you can say it and I'll repeat it. Good question. So we're doing a lot of cool tech stuff, interesting stuff uh, for clients. Are we able to take what we make and open source it so other people can use it? Um, the, no. Uh, but <laughs> that's not because, actually that's not true. It's not because we like to hoard and are crazy. It's because almost everything we make is open source. It's, half of that stuff is built on Cinder, open frameworks, some processing. It's all open source libraries, and that's where it started. So it's right back into the ecosystem for sure. Um, stuff like the heat map, the Nike DataViz thing, is a pretty, it's built in a thing called Polycode, um, which is another sort of similar framework. Um, but again, all available and open source. But it's, it's pretty you know, opaque except for the right communities. But that stuff's open as part of it. So I guess yes and no in a weird way. Um, we're not productizing anything, so it's kind of just there. It was there to start with, and it's still there, you know? Anybody? Tough one. Um, okay, so the idea is transparency is making things clear, but what's the idea of transparency in terms of the roles of some of our clients and what they deal with on a daily basis? Right, so is the question um, do we have the ability to affect how they're thinking about that transparency or? Right, we're at resources and... And, and, it's, and the definition I'm hearing today is more about how do we communicate big ideas in a kind of a simple way. Mm -hmm. So how do we get, how do, we, how do you reconcile those definitions? 
It's a good question. I mean, you know, from what our business is set up to do fundamentally, um, sometimes it's only talking about here's the thing and let's talk about all this crazy stuff about it in a very clear way to our audience. So how the thing got to be where it is today, it's history, it's inputs, it's resources, it's raw materials, it's supply chain, it might be something they do or don't want to talk about. I would say I teased the project for ExxonMobil in the beginning. Um, obviously, big company, you know, everyone here probably has their preconceptions about it. Um, but what was interesting about that project, it was exactly what you're talking about. It was open sourcing or referencing the history that's come to create this mess we have in the Persian Gulf, and it's trying to talk about how the future of that can be reconciled. It's by no means a non-profit point of view. It's about profit, but it's also about all the other factors, environmental, other, uh, to create efficiencies. And so for us, that was a really interesting opportunity to work with, a, I think, the largest company in the world, if you talk about market cap, um, to think about a century of supply chain in the largest region in the world, the production. So I think that was a perfect example of saying, bringing to transparency to all parties, political people, um, engineers, uh, nation states, um, scientists, uh, other corporations involved in the region in that supply chain, and saying, hey guys, we all have to work on this together, and this is the best way forward. I don't know, I hope that answer was somewhat enough. We can talk candidly later. So, so my question is a little bit more practical about the client part of it. <laughs> okay, that's easy. I, you know, I could see head shaking over here like, oh, I love that. I love the big idea. I love selling the big idea to the client. Um, and especially when I see the timelines on some of the projects you've worked on, how do you keep those clients engaged? You, ro you romance them into the, into the, you know, the genius of the, of the idea and the, the build out. But as we know, you know, clients are fickle. They tend to sometimes get bored quickly. And multiple stakeholders. How, how do you guys do that? I mean, that's the seems to be the biggest challenge with our agency is just constantly get the keeping them engaged and keeping them from changing their minds and all that stuff. Do you have some trick of of the trade, some magic you want to share with us? No, I I wish. And you know, part of standing up here is you know you only show the best. So there's a lot of other stuff going on that is challenging for a million other reasons. So I always thought that was really weird because you know when I sit there and I listen to people speak, it's just, there's such a clarity, but you know, we all know in reality there's no clarity. There's tons of crap going on that's insane. Um, but I would say, and I don't know your agency or how big it is or, or who you're working with, but I think, you know, we're, we're small. We're like a boutique 20, 30 person company, um, you know, expand and contract as we need, but that's our core. And um, because of that, I think we're not trying to solve like huge, huge problems, you know? Even though we're working on timelines that could be a year down to maybe two months, um, we're still not generating global campaign, yabba, yabba, yabba. And that's where you get problems because you have to align all these people. You know, we're working with a lot of the really important stakeholders of these companies, but, you know, we're doing a specific thing. We're trying to tell a very specific story, you know? And even if it's big, like a football field size for Nike and it's really expensive, it's still a specific thing, you know? And so I think we skirt that issue a little bit. The other thing is, and this is a testament to our clients, or our really good clients, is that they're as, they're as into it as we are. And Nike, you know, you know, everyone says Nike, 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 and it's kind of like a broken record now. But, you know, to their credit, some of their lead creative directors and clients are, their, their, their taste level and their demand level is higher than most people I've ever worked with. So the brief you get from them is, you know, you, you're taken aback a little bit by how advanced it is. So you can't bring anything but like 120% and your big guns. So, you know, the dialogue's already there, the challenge is already there. It's like a really, it's a really one-upsmanship kind of relationship. So you kind of want to like ping back and forth. So I don't know, I think it's, if you're over-delivering every time and you're showing them things that are shocking, like I said, we sent a, uh, I didn't say this. So to do that ExxonMobil project, we sent a, um, you know what a tangram is? We sent a tangram to the client and said, this is what we're gonna do to, to, to tell the story of the, the largest production re region in the world. And it freaked the hell out of like everybody, except for the one stakeholder we had was like, okay, you guys are insane, let's do this. Um, so I think you kind of have to, you, know, you, have, if you have to be 100% challenged, and you have to know that you have to challenge your audience every time, because then they're kind of on their heels and unexpected, and you keep challenging them, and, and they kind of stick with that, you know? What's a tangram? 
What's a tangram? Easy. You've, <laughs> you've all seen it. It's just a puzzle made out of like uh, triangles and, and shapes. It's like a kid's puzzle. Um, and, and the reason why we sent them that was because uh, the whole metaphor of that project was things make sense when they're organized and things don't make sense when they're disparate parts off axis and whatever. And that was all it is, is cleaning up that entire ecosystem of production and making it make sense as a landscape. That's what that toy is about. It's about building blocks that have a right way to work and a wrong way to work, just innately as a human being. Like you see it, if it doesn't feel right, you see it assembled in a way, it feels right. So that was the metaphor and we built from there and you know, we probably like almost lost the job there, but that, I mean, we got lucky, whatever. So. Thanks for the session, David. My, my question and possibly your answer might overlap with the last one a little, but uh, again, from a client relationship perspective, in cases like IBM or the work you did demonstrated here for Nike, yeah. Uh, what kind of metrics or numbers are they tracking and how do they know whether you've been successful or not? How do you say whether these campaigns worked or didn't work or somewhere in the middle? We don't do metrics. And the client? They don't do metrics. God, sounds fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I said, I was, I was, <laughs> I'm lying a little bit. Um, you know I'm lying a little bit. But uh, I'm, I'm basically suggesting that our company is more into the intangible feeling of it, the brand aspect of it, the, 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 the wow, that was really amazing interest aspect of it. And because we work in these like physical digital spaces a lot, like the metrics are soft from the get-go, you know? You know, how many people enjoyed that Nike thing? Uh, I, could, I knew how many people ran on the treadmill, I knew how much data we captured, I know approximate ticket sales. I don't know if they all went through it. They probably did, probably saw it, probably were exposed to some piece of the Nike. Did they all run? I don't know. It's, it's soft to start with, so we don't even play that game. Obviously, we work in other mediums that are much more highly quant quantifiable. You know, when we're on the web, we're doing video things, you know, we can do views. But even then, we, don't, we kind of say we don't have the code to go with us. If it's cool, it's cool. I just think we, we just shy away from that whole thing because there's, there is room for just poetic experience in this world. There is. We all do it. We all go to the movies. We all go to shop at a retail store, not to buy, just to be and kind of feel things and hold things. We all go to theatrical events. We all go to sporting events. There's something to just be there that doesn't have to be quantified. So I totally screwed at your answer, but sorry. That's the truth. <laughs> I think we have five minutes and maybe a couple more. Yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about it. That's, that balance between abstraction and narrative seems to be inherent in every single project that you've showed us and what you're talking about. And you started off the talk with the first lens, which was the brief that you guys got. How are you guys balancing that brief? We recognize that it's, an, it's one that's not choosing narrative versus mm -hmm. abstraction, so therefore you have to guide it. Mm -hmm. How are you guys handling getting that brief to one you can work with? It's a great question. Um, every client's different, so where we engage is always different. You know, we're always engaged somewhere in the concept development phase. It could be from the ground up, or it could be later in the game once they've kind of molded it into a clay statue or something. I don't know. So, um, but where we are engaged in that process is really highly related to you know how how much we can do or where, where we can focus or you know, the breadth of our ideas or if we can play in all media or we can have to focus on a single one. I think um, we've been lucky to be higher enough up the chain that we get to play and, and broaden out the idea. But um, I don't know. I think for that Nike project which you're referencing, that brief was probably the widest brief we've ever gotten. Um, and we had the most time for the mo most of our projects. So you had a lot of different ways to go. But that being said, I think the first thing we do, and I think it's, it's just what, what everyone here should do is, you know, be willing to lose the job because you don't believe in the chosen medium. Do you know what I mean? So if someone's like, oh, we want to build an iPad app that's going to do that, blah, blah, blah. You know, the first thing I know all of our ears do when we're in a meeting is, why are they doing that? You know? And if there's strategic reasoning behind it, sure, it makes sense, great. But if there's a gut feeling that we're like, no one's going to use this thing. No one cares about this thing, you know? If we're saying that, we vocalize that to the client. And sometimes we've talked ourselves out of jobs. We're just like, this is crazy. Like, 
this is an insane thing to do. I don't think we should do this for you. And, and it's not the best outcome or the smartest outcome, but it's, it's like part of it, you know? Or maybe it gets folded in. It's like, okay, cool. Well, we should do that, but we should also do this piece too because that'll create a better ecosystem, et cetera. So I think it's like, just don't take anything at face value, you know? If there's leeway and flexibility to play, like we'll, we'll try to skirt the issue or we'll try to expand on what, what they have or whatever. I don't know if I answered that question, but... It's a fuzzy question. Yeah, so I give a fuzzy answer. Fair. Any last one? Three, two, one. Yeah, I can, I'm going to hang out after if anyone wants to candidly come up. But thank you.